A battle that isn't really talked about much, but actually has a pretty significant impact on Middle-earth is the battle between the Dwarves and the Dragons. It takes place in the Third Age between the year 2570 and 2589. It brought about the death of some key players in Middle-earth at the time and resulted in some factors that potentially changed the course of history in Middle-earth. I will be covering all the known details of the war in this video as well as talking about what may have happened if it had never taken place. I really hope you enjoy this video guys, let's get into it. Before we go too far, I'd like to remind you that we are now streaming Middle Earth games over on Twitch a few times a week. So far we have been playing through Battle for Middle Earth, Shadow of War and live streaming some Middle Earth strategy battle game. It's been an absolute blast so if you're into Lord of the Rings based games, head over to the Tabletop Alliance on Twitch and give us a follow or a subscribe. Thanks guys! So how did the War of Dwarves and Dragons come about? Well it all begins with the War of Wrath. The Great Battle was the final conflict during the Wars of Beleriand in the First Age, fought between the host of the West and the forces of the Dark Lord Morgoth. It was a war that lasted almost four decades and was so devastating that it left the lands of Beleriand mostly destroyed and underwater. As the war carried into its final years, Morgoth was on the verge of defeat and so he unleashed his last desperate assault, the Winged Dragons, which had never been seen in Middle-earth before. The host of Valinor was taken by surprise and were overcome by the devastation that the dragons brought with them. They were driven back across the region. The greatest of these dragons was Ancalagon the Black, the largest and most powerful dragon in the history of Arda, and the damage his dragon horde inflicted on the host of the Valar was staggering. The skies erupted with lightning and flame at the dragon's arrival, and Morgoth's forces repelled the host of the Valar, pushing them away from Angband. Fortunately, before the situation became too dire, Irendil came in his skyship with Thorondor and a great host of great eagles. Over the next day, the eagles fought back the dragons and Irendil eventually killed Ancalagon. With the mighty dragon now gone, morale was restored and the forces of the Valar pushed the enemy back once more. They defeated the majority of Morgoth's armies and forced the survivors to flee into the depths of the world. Many of the surviving servants of Morgoth fled to the east and the north of Middle-earth. And this now brings us to how there were dragons around this area in the Third Age. If you'd like to know any more about the Wars of Beleriand or Ancalagon the Black, we have full videos on them both that you can check out. So through the Second and Third Age, the seven rings of power that were given to the dwarves by Sauron helped the dwarves increase their treasure troves and helped them establish their legendary seven hordes. These hordes were just massive hordes of gold and treasure that most likely belonged to each of the seven dwarven clans. As we know, dragons love treasure, hence the whole Smaug situation. So it wasn't long before these hordes came to the attention of the dragons that had been living and breeding around the Grey Mountains. At the height of his power, Sauron was said to have assembled most of the leftovers of Morgoth's forces under his kinship possibly some of the dragons as well. Though no account of the Second Age makes any notable mention of such servant, it doesn't mean that it wasn't the case. Over the centuries then, the race of dragons continued to breed and repopulate, particularly in the Withered Heath, an area between the two spurs of the Grey Mountains. Now following the loss of khazad or Moria to the Belrog in 1999 of the Third Age, Thrain I established the kingdom under the mountain at Erebor, However, in 2210, Thrain's son, Thorin I, abandoned Erebor and removed his people to the Grey Mountains to join the rest of Durin's folk. This is mainly due to the unexplored richness of the mountains. The dragons in the north eventually multiplied and became strong, and in the year 2570 they made war on Durin's folk, sacking and plundering their halls. The dwarves held out for around 20 years, but finally in 2589 the dragons attacked the halls of King Dane I. King Dane and his second son Fror were killed by a great cold drake outside the doors of his halls. Following the death of their king, most of Durin's folk abandoned the Grey Mountains, and in 2590 King Thror and his uncle Borin returned to Erebor with the Arkenstone to re-establish the kingdom under the mountain. However, Thror's younger brother Gror led others to the Iron Hills, once again splitting up many of Durin's folk. 
Now pretty much all of this information comes from a small section of the appendices of Return of the King. Most of those that escaped made their way into the north, and Thrain I, named Sun, came to Erebor, the Lonely Mountain, near the eastern eaves of Mirkwood, and there he began new works, and became king under the mountain. In Erebor he found the Great Jewel, the Arkenstone, heart of the mountain. But Thorin I, his son, removed and went into the far north to the Grey Mountains, where most of Durin's folk were now gathering, for those mountains were rich and little explored. But there were dragons in the wastes beyond, and after many years they became strong again and multiplied, and they made war on the dwarves, and plundered their works. At last, Dane I, together with Fro, his second son, was slain at the doors of his hall by a great cold drake. Not long after, most of Durin's folk abandoned the Grey Mountains. Gro, Dane's son, went away with many followers to the Iron Hills, but Thro, Dane's heir, with Borin, his father's brother, and the remainder of the people returned to Erebor. So as you can see from this quote, Tolkien gave us a lot of information about a very important battle in just two small paragraphs. Such is the writing of the great J.R.R. Tolkien. Now fortunately this was pretty much the last we hear of dragons interfering with stuff in Middle-earth. Well, apart from Smaug of course, but you all know that story. Now why was this war so significant? Well apart from King Dane the first being killed, I would be inclined to suggest that if the dwarves had not left Erebor originally, then perhaps their prosperity and wealth may have led to far better defences. Because let's not forget, they did not just make things of wonder and beauty, but weapons and armour as well. If they had spent 20 plus years growing their armies and their armories instead of wasting warriors and resources on fighting dragons in the Grey Mountains, then who knows what the Dwarven force would have looked like later in the Third Age. Had they not disrupted the dragons in the mountains, then news of their treasure in Erebor may never have reached Smaug. So the rumour of the wealth of Erebor spread abroad and reached the ears of the dragons. And at last Smaug the Golden, greatest of the dragons of his day, arose and without warning came against King Thror and descended on the mountain in flames. It was not long before all that realm was destroyed, and the town of Dale nearby was ruined and deserted. But Smaug entered into the Great Hall and lay there upon a bed of gold. If that was the case, if the dwarves of Erebor had never come to the attention of Smaug and the dwarves hadn't fought the dragons, then who knows, maybe the dwarves would have lived for much longer into the 4th and even 5th ages. I can only imagine how many dwarven lives were lost between this war, the initial takeover by Smaug and then the subsequent battle of five armies. Huge, huge ramifications that could have all started from this one war. It surprises me that this doesn't get talked about more. We literally just released a video earlier this week on how the dragons in Middle-earth were created, so if you're interested in learning more about them, there are some great details in that. My question for you guys today is this. If Sauron had recruited the remaining dragons from the northeast into his army to attack the west during the War of the Ring, do you think things would have gone differently? Obviously we had fell beasts that the Nazgul were riding, but these are very different to dragons and drakes. Let us know your thoughts on that in the comments down below. Okay, time has come as always to thank our patrons. A big shout out goes to the members of the three highest tiers, Kevin, Abram, Matt, Nasheeth, Denver Steel, Gregory, John and Andrew. We can't thank you all enough for the support towards this channel and our short film. If you're interested in supporting yourself, you can do so via our Patreon page. There's a variety of tiers on there that you can choose from. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and go and check out the Tabletop Alliance not only on YouTube but on Twitch as well. Like I said at the start, we are streaming Middle Earth games twice a week, every Tuesday and every Friday. And it's so much fun to interact with you guys on a regular basis. So please go and check that out. I hope you have a great day and I'll see you next time on The Broken Sword. Build me an army worthy of war.